Grass. Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we look forward to a blessing for this new week, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance as we open his word and we begin to study anew this section of the book of Judges? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, it is with wonder that we come before you. There are many things that you are teaching us, that you are showing us, where you are guiding us. Things that are important for us to understand for this time in this earth's history. Be with us today, Father. Forgive us of our sins. Direct us so that we may draw closer to you. Help us so that we may become fit vessels for your spirit. Direct us so that our body temples may be cleansed, that you will guide us so that we may become more like you and be prepared for your robe, for that of the marriage of your son. To this end, Father, we thank you. We ask for your angels to attend us, that we may be guided by you and by the spirit in all things that we do. May we represent you to those with whom we come in contact today. For this, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are again going to be opening Judges chapter 6. In this situation, we're also going to look at one article that Mrs. White had written. And this is Signs of the Times, 23rd of June, 1881. Gideon desired some token that the one now addressing him was the same that spoke to Moses in the burning bush. The angel had veiled the divine glory of his presence, but it was no other than Christ, the Son of God. When a prophet or an angel delivered a divine message, his words were, the Lord saith, I will do this. But it is stated of the person who talked with Gideon, the Lord said unto him, I will be with thee. Have we considered this carefully over these last few days? Here is Christ coming to the garden with Adam and Eve. Here is Christ coming to Moses in the burning bush. <clears throat> Here is Christ coming to Gideon. Many other times do we find Christ has come to those upon whom special honor is to be presented. Desiring to show special honor to his illustrious visitor and having obtained the assurance that the angel would tarry, Gideon hastened to his tent and out of his scanty store prepared a kid and unleavened cakes, which he brought forth to set before him. Gideon was poor, yet he was ready to use hospitality without grudging. <clears throat> Gideon chose to share that which he had. How often are we able to do the same? And how often are we doing the same? As the gift was presented, the angel said, take the flesh in the oven and pour out the broth. Gideon did so, and then the Lord gave him the sign which he desired. With the staff in his hand, the angel touched the flesh, 
and the unleavened cakes and a fire rose up out of the rock and consumed the whole as a sacrifice and not as a hospitable meal for he was God and not man. After this token of his divine character, the angel disappeared. When convinced that he had looked upon the son of God, Gideon was filled with fear and exclaimed, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. Then the Lord graciously appeared to Gideon a second time and said, Peace be unto thee. Fear not, thou shalt not die. These gracious words were spoken by the same compassionate Savior who said to the tempted disciples upon the stormy sea, It is I, be not afraid. He who appeared to those sorrowing ones in the upper chamber and spoke the selfsame words addressed to Gideon, Peace be unto you. The very same Jesus who walked in humiliation as a man among the children of men came to his ancient people to counsel and direct, to command, to encourage, and to reprove them. <clears throat> the family to which Gideon belonged was grievously infected with idolatry. His father erected at Ophrah, where he dwelt, a large altar to Baal, at which the people of the towns worshipped. Gideon was commanded to destroy the altar, to cut down the groves that surrounded it, and in its stead to erect an altar to Jehovah over the rock on which the offering had been consumed and then to offer a sacrifice unto the Lord. Gideon faithfully carried out these directions, performing the work by night, lest he should be compelled to desist if he attempted it by day. <clears throat> so how many rocks would have been involved in this altar? How many stones were involved in an altar, such as what Joshua had, had erected, such as what Abraham had erected, <clears throat> and such as what? No, they would pile up, they'd pile up stones to make um, it. There were 12, right? 12 main stones, at least. That's what, what I'm recalling, is that there were 12 stones. But we don't really know how many stones Abraham set up. Right. I think it was more after, after the 12 tribes were established and came in to the promised land. There was 12 stones. But uh, Abraham, we're not sure. I'm, I'm not, unless where the prophecy says something. Okay. I'm not aware. I know we, he set up altars, but uh, we don't really know how many stones were, were involved. And you're right, Stephen. <clears throat> At this point, there, the 12 stones were largely erected to signify the 12 tribes. But here we are told of an altar that is erected over a stone. What is the symbolic representation of this rock on which the flesh and the unleavened cakes had been set. What symbolism can we take from this? I think the main rock would, would be Christ. The, the cornerstone, as it were. That's kind of the, the thought that I've been taking from this. <clears throat> so... Here is Gideon. He is instructed to present this meal, his offering, and to present it upon a rock. Christ touches it with his staff. Fire comes out of the rock. 
and the offering is consumed. <clears throat> The deliverer of Israel must declare war upon idolatry before he went to battle with the enemies of his people. He must esteem the honor of God above the credit of his father and regard the divine commands as more obligatory than parental authority. What is this saying to us today? When Jesus said, if you love your family, your friends more than me, you have no part with me. How else can we apply this? What was infected by idolatry? Weren't the tribes infected with idolatry? The children of Israel. Can we see or could we apply this, that this is us, the movement, and the church that have been affected by idolatry so that we must declare war upon this before we can proclaim the warning against the Sunday law. Reach the lost house of Israel. Okay. Regarding the fire coming out of the rock, I was getting, uh, can't explain it to you, but here it is, 12, Luke 12, 49 and 50. I am come. This is Christ speaking to send fire on the earth. And what will I, if it be already kindled, but I have a baptism to be baptized with. And how am I straightened a burden till it be accomplished? Okay. <clears throat> and then he says, suppose ye that I'm come to give peace on earth. I tell you nay, but rather division. And then he explains what's going to be going on with households and nations and so forth. Well, not nations, but families anyway. Okay. The offering of sacrifice unto the Lord had been committed to priests and Levites and had been restricted to the altar at Shiloh. That he who had established the Jewish economy and to whom all of its services pointed had power to change its requirements. Was Gideon a priest? Was he of the tribe of Levi? No. Gideon was of the tribe of Manasseh the half-tribe of Manasseh, he was a descendant of Joseph. In this instance, he saw fit to depart from the ritual appointment. It was of great importance that the deliverance of Israel should be preceded by a solemn protest against the worship of Baal and an acknowledgement of Jehovah as the only true and living God. Brothers and sisters, at this time, are we to look upon the edifice of the corporate church as our means of salvation? Are we to look upon what has remained of Future for America in the same way? 
who no. are we to look through? sorry go ahead i just said i just said no right you can't who are we to look to for our salvation christ 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 alone alone, alone right Is this not what we are being shown with this in, in this, this example of Gideon? When the men of the city, early in the morning, came to pay their devotions to Baal, they were greatly surprised and enraged at what had taken place. Soon it was known that Gideon had done this. And then nothing but his blood could satisfy those deluded idolaters. They at once began to put forth efforts to take his life. <clears throat> Is this not a, another representation in type of what we see in the book of Daniel? and what we have addressed as the Sunday law. Yes, and you know, Dwight, I'm thinking about what uh, James White had written about gossip. He was comparing it to murder. Or right. He used the term almost either, either that strong or almost as strong. And that's one of the major reasons why I don't associate unless they come to me with the folks in the church around here, because that was the paramount, I think anyway, sin of that church. Gideon had told his father, Joash, of the angel's visit and the promise that Israel should be delivered. He also related to him the divine command to destroy the altar of Baal. The Spirit of God moved upon the heart of Joash. He saw that the gods whom he had worshipped had no power even to save themselves from utter destruction. And hence, they could not protect their worshippers. When the idolatrous multitude clamored for the death of Gideon, Joash fearlessly stood in his defense and endeavored to show the people how powerless and unworthy of trust or adoration were their gods. Will ye plead for Baal? Will ye save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death whilst it is yet morning. If he be a god, let him plead for himself, because one hath cast down his altar. He reminded them that the penalty of death would justify, would justly rest upon themselves instead of Gideon, for they had broken the law of God against idolatry. When I first came into this movement, there was a couple that was very focused upon giving this word to all that would hear it. Sadly, their decision has been that they must return to the corporate church. They have renounced everything that they once held dear. They have agreed never to speak of the seven times of Leviticus 26. They have agreed not to speak of anything having to do with any of this type of study. The idolatry has infected many. May your names remain. was an admonition in the Millerite time. Brothers and sisters, may your name remain under the banner of Prince Emmanuel. 
The whole transaction with the stirring appeals of Gideon produced a powerful effect upon the people of Ophrah. All thoughts of violence were dismissed. And when moved by the spirit of the Lord, Gideon sounded the trumpet of war. They were among the first to gather to him. He then sent messengers through his own tribe of Manasseh and also to Asher, to Zebulun, and to Naphtali, <clears throat> and all cheerfully obeyed the call. Is there at least one tribe that is missing from this list? And from this description? Where is Ephraim? Because wouldn't a brother call a brother? Wouldn't he send this to his brother first? Granted, Manasseh had territory on the east side, as did Gad and as did Reuben. But if strife were to come upon Manasseh, wouldn't it have been logical for him to call upon his brother for assistance? Gideon deeply felt his own insufficiency for the great work before him. He dared not place himself at the head of the army without positive evidence that God had called him to this work and that he would be with him. He prayed, if thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor. And if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon all the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. The Lord granted the prayer of his servant. In the morning, the fleece was wet while the ground was dry. But now unbelief suggested that wool naturally absor absorbs moisture when there is any in the air and that the test was not decisive. Hence, he asked a renewal of the sign, humbly pleading that unbelief might not move the Lord to anger. His request was granted. The Lord does not always choose for his work men of the greatest talents, but he selects those that he can best use. Individuals who might do good service for God may for a time be left in obscurity, apparently unnoticed and unemployed by their master. But if they faithfully perform the duties of their humble position, cherishing a willingness to labor and to sacrifice for him, he will in his own time entrust them with greater responsibilities. The for honor is humility. The Lord can use most effectually those who are most sensible of their own unworthiness and inefficiency. He will teach them to exercise the courage of faith. He will make them strong by uniting their weakness to his might, wise by connecting their ignorance with his wisdom. Now, God will accept the services of all who will work in obedience to his will, who will not for any consideration bring a stain upon the conscience, <clears throat> who will not permit any influence to lead them from the path of duty. If we choose, we may make the record of our lives such as we shall not be ashamed to own when the secrets of all hearts shall stand revealed and every man's work shall be weighed in the balances of truth. 
The Lord employs men as his co-laborers, but let none imagine that they are essential to the work of God that they cannot be dispensed with. The teachable and trusting ones, having a right purpose and a pure heart, need not wait for great occasions or for extraordinary abilities before they employ their powers. They should not stand irresolute, questioning and fearing what the world will say or think of them. We are not to weary ourselves with anxious care, but to go on quietly performing with faithfulness the work which God assigns us and leaving the result wholly with him. If they but preserve their sincerity, their meekness and humility, the poorest, weakest, and humblest of Christ's followers working in love may start waves of blessing that shall go on widening and deepening to refresh and bless the world. In order that they may do this, Christ must shine forth in their character. Let the daily life be a reflection of the life of Christ. And the testimony thus born to the world will have a powerful influence. Heaven alone will reveal the fruits of an unselfish holy life. The great contest of truth against error must be carried forward by men who kindle their taper at the divine altar. Evil may seem for a time to prevail, but in the end, righteousness will gain the victory. Every righteous act will be recorded in the book of life and will be remembered and rewarded of God. How many assurances did Gideon receive that he was being led of God? Come now, we've just read these. How many, how many assurances were there? Well, at least three. Depends how you count them. Okay, how would you count them? Well, I guess, um, I mean, just the fact that an angel comes to him is one. And the angel is Christ, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so he has Christ come to him. So that's the first one. Um, of course, he's going to have the two signs in the fleece. He's going to have the offering being accepted. Would uh, this not be four? Yeah, it would be four if I count it that way. Yep. Yeah. We have currently the three angels message, and we have the other angel of Revelation 18. Gideon was given four evidences that he was being led of God. Here is the situation. His family, his father, and the townspeople listened carefully and then the call was made to other tribes are we not being shown the progression that we must eliminate the idolatry the sin from our lives before we are prepared to battle that of the adversary. Now we will return. Yep, wrong one.
Okay, I've got to open this a different way. My apology. When I'm looking at his response to having Christ come and talk to him, it reminds me of Isaiah's and Isaiah 6. Alas, I am undone, for I have looked upon the Lord or the angel of the Lord. Okay. Okay. Now, as we are here in the call of Gideon, we were addressing several points this last week. So as we see this from verse 622, and when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, alas, O Lord God, for before I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. As Mrs. White had written, and as we now see, and the Lord said unto him, peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. Unto this day it is yet in Ophrah of the Abizarite. Why is it important that we should acknowledge and understand the Lord would send peace? Jehovah Shalom. Do we not have peace that passes understanding if we follow the word of the Lord? And if we do that which he instructs us? How else could we look at this? I'm looking at the 622, I mean, that was when the school of the prophet, the prophets was set up, right? Or that's when they got the, the big check to set up the school of the prophets. I think June that's 22nd. correct. Uh, forget what year, but anyway, was it 2014 or 2011 or whatever? 2011. 2011, okay. So we have a symbol there of the blessing that came not only to future for America, but to all of us. What symbol can we take from the altar? Now, in this situation, the translators applied several other verses to this with Judges 6.24 regarding the altar. Genesis 22.14, and Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, for it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. And in those days, Jeremiah 33, 16, and in those days shall Judah be saved and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called the Lord, our righteousness. And then we look at Ezekiel 48, 35. 
It was round about 18,000 measures. And the name of the city from that day shall be, the Lord is there. Now, the Lord our righteousness and the Lord is there. How would that be expressed in the Hebrew? What do you mean, how is it expressed in the Hebrew? Well, the Lord our righteousness is the translation in the English. Okay, so Jehovah Jireh is the Lord, it shall be seen. We have Jehovah Shalom as the Lord shall send peace. So how would how would this be expressed if we're looking at this Jeremiah 33 16? Righteousness is Sadek. Okay. So is that Yehovah Sadek? Yeah. Okay. And then in Ezekiel 48:35. We would have Jehovah Sham. Would we not want the Lord to be with us in everything, day by day? Is are these verses that we're looking at not a description of what? we are saying we want within our own lives? And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath and cut down the grove that is by it. So you have a young bullock and you have the second bullock of seven years. What can we apply here in symbols? I mean, the second bullock is pretty simple. But what symbol do we see with the young bullock and its combination with the second bullock of seven years? Okay, Jeremiah 33, 16, does that have an application with the questions I just asked? Probably not, but you know, I'm lagging behind here and typing and trying to find the verse that, well, the proof of what I'm saying, because I'm really not certain what part of the garment or what part of their attire it was written. Okay. So, so why would, would, would the second bullet be like the second angel? Are you are you saying that the second bullock of seven years like the second angel? Yeah. Okay, how could we how could we apply that? I mean we have we have this young bullock. 
being introduced here. We know that there is a certain requirement for the sacrifice. I don't recall that a bullock of seven years would be one that would be acceptable as a sacrifice. And I, I'm more than willing to be corrected on that. Well, I don't remember it being ever mentioned before, but um, <clears throat> not sure. Um, I mean, it would be a symbol of the seven times. Right. So that's the main thing I would see. Could we apply the seven times with the second angel's message? Well, yeah, it's a tied to the second angel's message. Okay, so then Brother William's point would be correct, right? Yeah. Okay. The next part of the instruction, and build an altar under the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock, upon the top of this strong place. For is Christ not the rock of our salvation? Are we not told where not to build our house? We are not to build it on shifting stand. We are to build it upon the rock. And build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock. In an orderly manner. And take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove, which thou shalt cut down. So the bullock of seven years was to be offered, was to be placed upon this as an offering, along with the wood of the grove. The covering of the idolatry. is to be used, is to be destroyed upon the altar to God. And you are to place the bullock of the seven times, the second angel's message upon that altar. What else can we see? Did Christ ever do anything in a disorderly manner? Think back to what the disciples found on the day of resurrection. When they went into the tomb, what did they see about the grave clothes? Well, they're folded neatly. So Fold the point, neatly. Exactly. The point that I'm trying to get at here is that Gideon is being told to emulate the character of Christ. Build an altar under the Lord thy God and upon the top of this rock in an orderly manner. Don't do it haphazardly. This is to be done as a symbol to show Christ's character to those that are going to inspect the altar later. Then Gideon took 10 men of his servants, as did the Lord, as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was because he feared his father's household and the men of the city 
that he could not do it by day, but he did it by night. Gideon took 10 men of his servants. You have a 10 and one combination. Were there any other times in scripture that we might see a 10 and one combination? Could it be a symbol of one tenth? Like the Isaiah six ends in one tenth, right? Okay. <clears throat> what about after the resurrection, you have 10 disciples, and you can either put it as 10 and Peter or 10 and Thomas. Because Judas was by this time dead by the side of the road. You have the one tenth, and the one tenth is to show the tithe. What else can it show? How many other things can we apply here? So Gideon and 10 men worked through the night to tear down the altar of Baal and to destroy the grove and to offer the sacrifice commanded. And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down and the grove was cut down that was by it. And the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. And they said one to another, who hath done this thing? And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, hath done this thing. Then the men of the city said unto Joash, bring out thy son, that he may die because he hath cast down the altar of Baal, and because he hath cut down the grove that was by it. Bring out your son. He has disrespected the movement. He has disrespected the church. He is to pay for his disrespect. This fellowship. There you go. Any other thoughts in this in this particular portion? Any other symbols that you're seeing at this point? And Joash said unto all that stood against him, <clears throat> Will ye plead for Baal? Will ye save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death while it is yet morning. If he be a god, let him plead for himself, because one hath cast down his altar. Therefore, on that day, he called him Jerub Baal, saying, let Baal plead against him, because he hath thrown down his altar. Let Baal plead. Judges 6.33. 
that all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. One of the points that Elder Jeff made about this many times. Here is a threefold union against one small group. Whether we have the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet, or we have the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the children of the east, it is still a three against one situation. Any thoughts, questions, or comments here? I was trying to find the verse. I think it's it's to do with the parents not being held accountable for the sins of their children or and vice versa. Okay. Uh, don't know where it is, but I'm pretty sure I read that somewhere. Ezekiel. Okay. How does that relate with what we're seeing here? Well, because Joash was saying, well, let Baal plead for himself. I mean, why would you be, be persecuting or prosecuting my son? Let the demon that you worship plead for himself. Leave my son alone, basically. That's what it sounds like to me. But as the words of Mrs. White, as we read those to begin with, was Joash not showing that to the men of this city, the men of Manasseh, that they had broken the law of God, they had placed an idol before God, had been worshiping an idol when they were not supposed to, and that the sentence of death, rather than resting upon Gideon, rested upon themselves, One of the points that we have had throughout our Sabbath studies. We are being shown the need of true conversion. We are looking into the book of Zephaniah. We are not here to point fingers to decide who is lost and who is not lost. If we point a finger at someone else, we have three fingers pointing right back at us. The men of the city came to worship, came to false worship, and decided that Gideon should die because he had torn down their altar. He had destroyed their church. He had put an end to their movement. They pointed the finger at Gideon when they had three times the fingers pointed right back at them. Gideon could not go battle against the threefold enemy unless he first battled within himself and did battle with the idolatry that was around him. Fail in any of those, he would fail against the threefold enemy. I noticed something about it, this judge real. Wasn't that the same? Is that the same valley that Ahab took the um, vineyard from his um, from his brother? Not his brother, but you know who I'm talking about. Okay, 
I don't recall, but you could be very right. <clears throat> Uh, you mean Naboth? Yeah, I think so. I think it's, that's his name. Naboth. Yeah, he he Ahab went and took and went back and complained to Jeze, Jezebel that that um he wouldn't give him the vineyard in Jezreel. Yeah, <clears throat> you're right. Well, it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which is in Jezreel, hard by the palace. Of Ahab, king of Samaria. That's First Kings twenty-one, one. Okay. But I don't know if it's the same Jezreel Valley. Is it anymore? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is there more than one Valley of Jezreel? I don't know. <clears throat> But it goes along with the verse if it if it if it's the same because Ahab and Jezebel and the prophets that rose on the three field union that was against Elijah. So <clears throat> maybe I'm just stretching things. I don't know. <laughs> no, you're not stretching. I hadn't thought there might be more than one valley of Jezreel. That's why I was laughing. Oh, there's another complication, maybe. All right. Let's look for just a second. Okay, I'm pulling up a, a map. I don't see more than one. Then one Jezreel? Right. Is there um, more than one? Yeah, there's more than one. Uh, oh. There's one in the south in Judah and one in Issachar. OK. So, but in this in this situation with what we are addressing, if there is one in Issachar, wouldn't that have been the area that that Gideon would have been led for the battle? He wouldn't have gone down to Judah. Mm -hmm. But the question is, is it the same one that's mentioned in the story of David? No, this, this, is this the same one that's mentioned in the same story as Ahab? Yeah, Ahab. So, yeah. so the, one, the one in Issachar would have been the one with Ahab in northern Israel. Okay. Right? Okay, yeah. Probably okay. that would be correct. Okay, so our the, the point being, we would be looking at Jezreel of Issachar. We are looking at the threefold union coming in, and they are pitching in the valley of Jezreel, likely that being the same valley of Jezreel. I think so, because I have a map here that Teddy had left, and it has it says Kishion, which I presume is Kish, Kishon, you know, the, where, the, where the prophets of Baal were slain, and it's right in that area. 
Okay. Now, yes, the car. Car, sorry. When we went over this before, still in Judges 6, but 6 3. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came against them. Now, this, this was a verse seconding the threefold union. But in Joshua 17, 16, we find, and the children of Joseph said, the hill is not enough for us. And all the Canaanites that dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron, both they who are of Beth Sheon and her towns, and they who are in the valley of Jezreel. So on the testimony of two, Joshua 17, 16, and this that we are looking at in the book of Judges, so Judges 6, 33, I think we'd be safe to look at this as being the Valley of Jezreel that also has something to do with Naboth. Mm -hmm, correct. Okay. So that's a nice point. But the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew a trumpet and a visor was gathered after him. Why is it important that we note in the alternate reading that the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon? Is he not accepting the robe of Christ's righteousness here? And then is he then, as he blows this trumpet, this trumpet of war. Why is it important that a visor is called after him? What are we actually seeing here? What is the meaning of a visor? Ezer is rock, Abby is uh, my father. Now, according to others. Okay. Well, I'm just saying, if I'm just looking at it here, I didn't look at uh, what do they have as a visor? Others oh, no. no, no, help. Pardon me, help. Okay. As there is help. So uh, my, the help of my father. So could this be the father of help? Yep. Is this a another way of saying God is my fortress? God is my help? Mm-hmm. So the spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon and he blew a trumpet and the father of help was gathered after him. Does this not give a representation of the church triumphant giving a message, a final message to the world.
And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also was gathered after him. And he sent messengers unto Asher and unto Zebulun and unto Naphtali. And they came up to meet him, to meet them. So we have Manasseh, who has territory on the east and the west. We have messengers that are sent to Asher, to Zebulun, and to Naphtali, all of which are western northwestern Israel. The other two tribes in the east are missing. The other tribe of the west that should be here is also missing. And Gideon said unto God, if thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool on the floor. And if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon all the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. Gideon has been visited by Christ. He has made an offering that has been accepted. Now he's questioning yet again. If it be dry upon the earth beside. And it was so, for he rose up early on the morrow and thrust the fleece together and wringed the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. Gideon is no different, really, than Moses and Aaron. For we see this in Exodus 4. And he said, cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom, and we took it out. Behold, his hand was as leprous as snow. And he said, put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and checked, plucked it out from his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. Moses, before he goes into Egypt, cast down his rod, and it becomes a snake. Before he goes into Egypt, his hand becomes as white as wool, like that which is leprous, and then is restored. Gideon is being given the same instructions, the same evidences that Moses was given. He is being shown that he has been chosen of God. And Gideon said unto God, let not thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece, let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon the ground, upon all the ground, let there be dew. And God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground.
what was important for getting to see that there was so much dew in that fleece that he could wring a bowl of water from the fleece alone. What symbol do we have for this with the water? Um, well, the ball being full, we could connect that to the full light pouring. Okay. Of the Holy Spirit. Right. I think Jeff had connected these two faces to uh, be in two groups, two classes of worshippers. And one receives the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and the other one um, is, is void of it. I would agree. So which do we wish to be today? What do we wish to see in the movement? Do we wish to see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or do we wish to be devoid of the Spirit? Are we not being presented with a choice? Are we not needing to stand as did Joshua, as did Moses, as did Elijah? Choose ye this day who you will serve. If the Lord be God, follow him. If Baal, be God, follow him. Is there any other way that we clearly can see this, that we can clearly apply this? Now, it reminds me of the dead, dry bones that need the spirit of God to revive them. And that's what I feel like sometimes. Okay. Now, we've reached the end of this chapter. Are there other symbols that we can draw from this for right now? Is there any other application that we can make in this? Well, I mean, when we look at the application that Jeff made of, of understanding this, it, it related to, um, I mean, ultimately the stories about the Sunday law. But we're applying it here now to this movement and really to July 18th. Right. So we, we haven't really shown what these different signs are. If we put them on a line... Maybe we could have, uh, because we could take um, Christ coming to him as being 9-11. I mean, that's one application of it. Would that make sense? Continue, please. Right. And then you're going to have uh, uh, this offering. There's a tearing down of an altar. There is, and then there are these two signs. And, and we, would, we would have to say, ask what these two signs are. Could the tearing down of the altar, since the, the bullock of seven years was involved, could this be a representation of reminding 
those in the movement and the church of the importance of the seven times of Leviticus 26. Yeah. And then we would have to have the fleece as being something like November 9th and July 18th. Right. Now, then we have, of course, an enemy, right, once again, and, and we have a judge raised up. So, again, this would point to some aspect in our movement, some error that is being corrected. And that has to do with a symbolically idolatry. I mean, it could be the idea that you know, we know the Seventh-day Adventists are embarrassed about time prophecies. And and we have had to, you know, make a time prediction. Now, we understand we can't predict events in the future. But that doesn't mean that time doesn't exist. And to me, the watching and waiting, part of that is measuring the time. Because otherwise, we, we don't really have much to watch and wait in the context in which the Bible and the spirit of prophecy are talking about this. Watching and waiting would have to be being aware of the time that we're in, not just in external events, but also in how those events are unfolding in a line. And time is one of the things that objectively helps us to measure that line and, and to see what, and understand what it means. Again, referring to Judge, uh, Isaiah 6, when Isaiah cried, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. So it's definitely, you know, foretelling a judgment and measuring time. How long, Lord, until your word is fulfilled? Just uh, reminded of the people before the flood. There was an aspect where they were to watch and wait. They had that 120 years time prophecy, but they also had Methuselah as well. They they were to watch and wait concerning him. And an aspect of Methuselah was uh, his age when he was 187 when um, he gave birth to Lamech. So I'm just thinking there's an aspect there. You maybe tie in the 187 to that watching and waiting, connect it with Methuselah. All right, anything else? So if we did place this onto a line, what would that look like? Well, I mean, we would have, we would just start from 9-11 and we would have this um, this offering of the, the bullock of seven years old representing uh, the 2520, but that's going to open up this truth in relationship to uh, time. And then, I, I mean, the tearing down of the altar itself, what what would that be? Well, what I'm what I'm considering and what I'm asking, if we begin this at 9-11-2001, would the offering of the bullock of seven years be equivalent to 2005 when the seven years is reintroduced into the message? Yeah, that would be when the seven times comes into the message after 9-11. And would that simultaneously then be the tearing down of the altar? 
with the yeah. al- with the altar having been the different methods of biblical interpretation yeah so that's going to happen the, the 2520 is going to open up this period in which we we restudy things i mean the beginning of on the first angel's message jeff's message was really not that much different than a seventh day adventist message about the coming sunday law you know as we saw when we looked back and, and studied the foundation now when 9 11 happened something happened for him unexpectedly which in some ways we might we we, we align it with july 18 2020 but also with uh, the disappointment of the uh, of the spring of 1844. so so now there's a re-examination of of the message to understand it further and that that brings about the understanding of the 2520 and then this this whole restudying of everything that becomes quite in some ways quite different from what he was presenting before 911 or before 2005 even right i mean it's it's an unfolding of it it's not a repudiation of it in any sense, but it it definitely brings uh, elements that he hadn't anticipated, but they all confirm and uh, align with what was understood in the past. All right, now. If we have placed the tearing down of the altar and the bullock of the seven times in 2005, we then, as you were saying, bring the fleece down to November 9th and July 18th. Mm -hmm. And the reason that we are looking at November 9th as the fleece that was wet that is wrung out with the water into the bowl which we are applying as the initial outpouring or an outpouring of the holy spirit then those that reject the message of july 18th are those that are refusing the spirit Mm -hmm. okay yeah, and then of course it follows with the Sunday law. Okay. Which is going to be the next chapter. So, so. Now, is there anything else we can we can glean from this? Well, not not necessarily from this, but just anticipating um, the rest of the study. So, one of the things we see when we when we lay out a line is we see that we can have a line but that line can have way marks and those way marks can have more details that are aligned as well which we're going to see as we go through the rest of the story of gideon so we'd have to look at though at the big line of gideon though starting from when uh, and, and remember there's also this prophet beforehand which would represent the first angel's message right Okay, so with the prophet beforehand, that would be prior to 9-11? Yeah. Okay. That's the first angel's message. And then because of that, there is now this second angel's message. In, in that, you know, if we're making the application that we are, that Christ's coming is 9-11, which would be consistent with what we've understood before. And it would fill in that first angel's message as being... Uh, the prophet that had prophesied that's referred to. So then, um, you know, we have that line. But now when we look at the story of Gideon, there's going to be, as you look at the way marks of the Sunday law, you'll see that there's a zoomed in detail as well. Um, But what we haven't answered is particularly what is the error. I mean, we have a general sense Uh, But I would say that it would have to relate to the idea of time. That 
because we know that there's no time prophecies after 1844, that we can't, God's not going to give another message based on time, um, we would have to understand that that only applies to the big line. But when we're applying time to our line, to our history, this is a repeat of Millerite history in which time exists. And what Parminder tried to do is undermine this entire thing by, by saying, well, we can predict time because we're in a different dispensation. And that's not correct. We are in a different line, but we're not in a different dispensation. It doesn't discount anything Ellen White has said about the big line. We know that we can't predict any of those events on the big line, whether it's the Sunday law or the close of probation or the second coming or any other province promise of special significance. So when we're looking at our line and we're looking at the time, it's because we're going through a repeat of history and, and this time that we're experiencing is not any of those things on the big line. So it's just something we're experiencing. It's a part of our watching and waiting. Okay. We're going to be looking at this a little deeper as we get into the next chapter. Now, do we have anything else that we could address on this chapter today. Any other thoughts or comments? Regarding the full bowl, I was thinking of David's comment in Psalm 56, eight, thou tellest my wanderings, put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? Which brought me to Ezekiel 9.4. And the Lord said unto him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. So we're to be, we are grieving for the errors of the mainstream church, the errors in the movement, our own sins. And God is taking a record of that. He's and that record, that record is eventually going to be revealed before the whole world. Amen. Oh, this is a sealing time. So that's a good point. Anyone else? All right, shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father, there are many points that we are now seeing from this with Gideon as how this example relates to us today. Help us that we may carefully consider this. Help us that as we consider it, we may let loose of those sins in our lives that are keeping us from a closer walk with you. May your will be done. May your guidance and the path that you would set before us be clear. May we see ever more the light that shines behind us, that's taking us further and further to your city. Help us to this end. May your spirit continue to guide us. May your angels be with us in all things that we do this day. For this we thank you. For this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.